You're listening to the Bearded Theologians podcast, hosted by Zach Bechtold and Matt Franks. If you'd like to learn more about the Bearded Theologians, you can go online at beardedtheologians.com, where we have past podcasts, blogs, and a couple items for sale. So check us out, beardedtheologians.com. Thank you for listening, and enjoy this week's show. You're listening to the Bearded Theologians podcast, hosted by Matt Franks and Zach Bechtold. And today we have a very special guest with us. We have David Wilson, who is the superintendent of the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference and a member of the Choctaw Nation with us today to tell us a little bit about who he is and uh, what he does there um, in Oklahoma. So David, thanks for being on. Thank you, Zach. It's good to be with the uh, with you and Matt this morning on your on your show. So thank you for the invitation. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Why don't you tell a little uh, our listeners a little bit about you know just who you are, where you're from, and what you do? Sure. My my uh, uh, day job, and I say that because there's so many hats that I wear, but wear that is here in Oklahoma City as a conference superintendent for uh, the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference. Uh, for those who are familiar with the Methodist Church. Uh, OMC Redbird, who's in uh, Kentucky and Alaska, the Alaska conference, all have conference superintendents. So really, uh, historically, have acted in, I guess, the easiest way to describe it would be uh, as assistants to Bishop of the Long Run Conference, since, most, since all three areas, the Bishop has at least two conferences. And so this has been historic in OMC uh, since the early days. And so my, my job is to do several things. One is since we are a missionary conference, we raise friends from across the church, from general agencies, local churches, individuals. So that's a big piece of my work and uh, administrative. And then, of course, helping to create and uh, develop leadership, native leadership for OMC, uh, for our local churches, both lay and clergy. And then we get to do a host of other things in church development. And uh, right now, one of our biggest tasks has been. Uh, the fundraising for a COVID-19 response for Native communities. So that's been keeping us busy. And we've been fortunate that uh, some folks have been good to us to help some of our smaller Native communities uh, in their uh, response to COVID-19. So David, um, where, how, like, how big is the OIMC? Like, where our church is located? Because I know there's more than just in Oklahoma, if I'm, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. There's, a, there's about 81 churches and new fellowships in OIMC. Uh, the majority are in eastern part of the state, among the uh, Choctaw Nation and Skokie Creek Nation. In the early, early days, we would have had a large number in the Cherokee Nation, but today there's just a handful, uh, four or five there in the Cherokee Nation. We also cover urban areas, Tulsa, Oklahoma City. And then the uh, tribes in the western part of the state, Apaches, uh, Comanches, uh, Cheyenne, uh, Kiowas. And then we stretch into Dallas, Texas. Dallas is an interesting, uh, Dallas and Wichita, interesting because they, they were, uh, you know, the government always did all kinds of interesting uh, projects with uh, racial ethnic people. And so in the I think late 50s, early 60s, the government had a program called the Relocation project. So this is across the country. So they went to reservations, rural areas, and told the people, if you'll um, leave your home, go to the cities, we'll find your jobs, we'll do training, uh, so forth and so forth. And so people bought into that. So they went to uh, Dallas, to Denver, to uh, Portland, to Seattle, to Kansas City, to Chicago, Los Angeles. And of course, when they got there, and nothing was paying for them. There were no jobs, there were no houses, and the rest of it. So Dallas is a relocation city, and because it's so close to Oklahoma, it was successful because if, if it didn't work, people could always go home and go back and forth. And so many of the folk who are at Dallas, the elders in the 80s, are products of relocation. Now the families are there, children, grandchildren, and they made Dallas the home. So Dallas is our strongest a church there in the Oak Cliff area. And then we have churches in Kansas, Wichita, um, Horton, Kansas, which is the only Reservation Church with Heaven One C and Lawrence, Kansas, which is home to Haskell Indian University. And our newest venture, uh, not new, but four or five years, we do a small Native fellowship in the Native American Center in Kansas City, Missouri. And so, because we're a missionary conference, wherever we have a large number of Native people, even outside of Oklahoma, 
uh, we used to have the ability to go and uh, create ministry there. So, David, um, this is um, one of those special Sundays um, in the United Methodist Church. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, Native mm -hmm. American Ministry Sunday? Sure, well, I was doing some of this work last night for a video I'm doing uh, later to promote this Sunday. In, 19, in 1988, the United Methodist Church created what was then called Native American Awareness Sunday. Today, it's been changed to Native American Ministries Sunday, and it was... Um, it was an effort to uh, promote Native American uh, ministries, but also to talk about the contributions we've made to the greater church and to, uh, to the community. And so that was the main piece to draw awareness to who we are. And then came an offering. And at that particular time, there was a big need for us to help educate Native people um, to serve the church. There's still a big need, but the dynamics have changed. And so the special offering that comes with the Sunday goes to do two things. It goes to help create uh, uh, scholarships for Native American students going to seminary to come on to become uh, pastors and other professional uh, careers in the church. And then the other piece goes to support ministries across the church. And so the special offering will go to those two particular things. I think I'd have maybe, uh, I'm thinking about including some retired elders to about 30 right now. Probably about 14 others have benefited from that uh, special offer in OMC. So it's a great uh, scholarship that the Journal of Board of Education and Ministry offers for Native people across the church. And then, of course, the ministry piece that helps to fund all kinds of projects that goes on. But the neatest thing for me, Matt, is, is the great need. The is very, very needed, especially in OMC. But the neatest thing for me is the opportunity to help tell people who we are, to talk about our past, to talk about our cultures and thoughts a culture because we think about 550 plus tribes nations and villages across this country and people are very very trying to see how you know, diverse we are as native american people but we're very proud of who we are what we do the contribution we made to the church and to greater society and that's always a great story to tell because there's so many stories as you tell across the church So, um, David, when you're when you're you've talked a lot about building up leadership and and things like that throughout throughout your conference. Um, what are some of the ways that uh, we can help promote that? And um, I don't know uh, how how can we help you build that uh, that leadership that resource bank? Oh yeah, thank you, thank you, Zach. You know, the, probably the biggest thing is you know across the country most. Uh, uh, probably at least half of the states in this country have uh, Native American ministry. I uh, mentioned from Montana, the Blackfeet Reservation there, which is uh, historic and has some done some great work and, uh, and continues to do so. In an area, area where that's desperately needed. And so I always encourage folks across the church, even when they come to Oklahoma from other states, you know, we get folks coming here from other states for volunteers and mission. And I was going to go home and learn more about the ministries that's within your backyard and your uh, jurisdiction and to know who they are and create these intentional relationships with people so you can really uh, go in and understand what the needs are, uh, to build community and to help move move from there. And then I'll tell the rest of the church about what they're doing, what's going on. There's, and, and of course, the great need, there's always a great need, but I, I think for Native people, Matt, Matt knows this well, you know, there's a... Uh, I should have stopped and people, people probably get tired of hearing this, but, you know, 560 plus tribes also different. Uh, we, we have our histories in common because of collective histories. Um, the same thing happens to all of us in the, how the government has treated us. Most of us are on our original land so forth and so forth. But the three things I've noticed when I've traveled along the country and indigenous peoples around the world, is that uh, many people understand what it means to be in the community. That, you know, in the early days, and even now, when we make decisions, it's not just for David. How it's going to affect me, but it's going to be how it will affect all of our people, all of our tribal people, all of our, our children. <clears throat> We're very intergenerational. And so it's no, it's no big deal for our households to consist of grandparents, parents, and grandkids. That's just how we get for that. And the, the other thing is how important relationships are to us. Very, very important. Uh, Native American people, 
not just one mother, tribal people, but for all the people who need mother races and patients. And that's very important. And and we work hard to develop those and to maintain those. And the other piece is the understanding of uh, hospitality. Any anywhere you go across Indian country, and when I travel around the world, it's the same. How giving these people are and uh, never leave a indigenous community without receiving something. Uh, if the church wants to give you, they want to give you. Because you have time to come visit, to learn about them, and to know who they are. You're listening to the Bearded Theologians podcast, hosted by Matt Franks and Zach Bechtold. And we have a very special guest with us here today. We have the Reverend David Wilson, who is the superintendent of the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference. David, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. Of course. Will you tell us uh, and our listeners a little bit about yourself, you know, who you are, where you're from, and a little bit about what you do? Sure will. I am a member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, which is, uh, I think, the second or third largest tribe in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, there and my uh, appointment with the Indian Missionary Conference is as conference superintendent in uh, OMC and Alaska and Redbird. The three missionary conferences have the position of a conference superintendent who really helps to run the day-to-day -day work of the annual conference. Since the bishop has uh, two areas, OMC is the only conference really that has specific ministry toward Native American people. Uh, among the three missionary conferences. So my day job is working with uh, fundraising since we are a missionary conference. We receive much funding from the general church and individuals, local churches. And then I also get to do some work around leadership development for our clergy and training events, uh, work with young people, do all sorts of things. So it's a great job because every week is it's a little bit different and it keeps it uh, exciting and keeps it moving. Yeah, one of my, uh, David, one of my favorite experiences of the OIMC was when I was at Oklahoma City University and we had a OIMC student day and I helped out with that as a religion major. Um, I think I helped with the free throw contest, if I remember correctly, yeah. Um, yeah. and just enjoyed getting to connect with them and connect with that conference. And I remember, to me, that was the first time that I got to experience that annual conference. I didn't grow up a Methodist and so I had no clue about all this stuff. And uh, yeah getting to engage that was really cool to see people were coming from all over um, mm -hmm. the area and, and having a great, you know, it was a great day. Um, and that, you know, just having that connection kind of started a whole other thing of me being uh, always semi-connected to a church when I've been in an area that has, because uh, um, you are spread out throughout the state. Um, and I've been, you know, I've been throughout all the state as a pastor. And so I've been trying to always connect mm -hmm. into an OIMC uh, to be connected because that's, you know, we're a connectional church. Yeah, and you know, one, one of the things you probably noticed, Matt, at the OMC day, Oklahoma City University does these days to invite students to come and tour the campus. It's really a, a, a recruiting tool uh, to expose folks to that. But when OMC has its day, uh, everybody comes. Uh, your grandparents come, your parents come, your kids come, and, and of course our young people come. It might be anywhere from elementary age to high school. And so that's just, that's just the nature of our communities. Uh, of being intergenerational, which is the same way in the life of the church. And I always appreciate OCE because they would have events for all ages and our folks enjoyed getting out and checking out the university, which was always so hospitable to us and, uh, and engaging us and us accepting us. And we still do those, Matt. Now, this year was canceled because of the COVID-19 virus, but it's still going strong and we appreciate, uh, we appreciate OCE and that connection that accepts us who we are as uh, you know, a people and what makes us unique as Native American people. So, uh, David, this Sunday in the church, uh, in, in the general church, is uh, designated as um, Native American Student Sunday. Uh, we want to care to talk a little bit about that and um, share with us a little bit about what that is, because some people may not know what that is. Well, in, in uh, 1988, I, was, I, was, uh, I wasn't even licensed yet. I was, uh, uh, at, uh, I was at OCU and working with the church on communications uh, and i was able to be a part of a uh, conversation around this sunday as it's first being created how we promote it so forth and so forth so when it first started it was an attempt to help uh, do two things one was to create scholarships for native students going to seminary and the second piece was to create awareness about who we are across the church and so we started that and and the sunday provides some great scholarships for Native American students in seminary. And this year, 
we're very fortunate we've been able to expand that to use it for our students who attend course of study school and that's been a great help because that's a big piece of our of our budget and so uh, so since 88 our churches have been uh, recognizing that uh, in, in many ways but also contributing funds that go not only now to seminary but they've expanded it in the early days it, it was solely for urban ministry which is where the latest data I saw was about 78% of our people, Native people now live in urban areas. And how it is defined is different from place to place. And then it changed later towards supporting ministries uh, across the church. And so it's a great work that goes on with both of those uh, pieces there. And so this Sunday, although you know, folks are doing uh, social media and recorded posts, and we're hoping that churches will uh, uh, remember and recognize this particular data to not only uh, observe with an offering, but also just to recognize uh, our presence in the church and the contributions we've made. And, and since I think, I, I, I could be wrong, but since Native folks are probably the lowest, the smallest uh, uh, group in the United Methodist Church, we are often overlooked. And so this is a great time for folks to recognize all the great things we're doing in OMC and in other places around the country uh, that support the work of the church and also uh, in our community. So we're excited about this. We recorded a, a service this week. We're still working on it, which we've done because of COVID-19. We recorded a service for Palm Sunday and for Easter and now for Sunday. So we've invited seven or eight people from across OMC to pre-record uh, tribal hymns. And Matt knows in, in all of our churches, a big piece of what we do is, is the sharing of our tribal hymns and our languages. And so we have people of all ages who will share those songs and uh, and then one of our retired pastors is sharing the message and then uh, one of our Cherokee elders from Tahlequah will be sharing the story about the tear dresses. So it's a good way to help educate people about who we are. And then we also put the resources on our website so people uh, in the local church can use litanies and videos and so forth to help uh, promote that Sunday. So we're excited about uh, this Sunday, even in the midst of us being uh, in, in worship in various ways, but we also know that people will recognize this day anytime throughout the year and always looking for resources, so we're happy we can provide those. That's Good. something that we experience here in, in Montana, having the Blackfeet Reservation um, and Four Corners and Native Grace um, and, I don't know, something like 20, almost 20 different tribes in our conference, in the Mountain Sky Conference area. Um, is is not only the awareness, but the intentionality to say, well, yeah, we do have Native American Sunday this Sunday, but how do we continue to support and do these things throughout the year um, and just be be helpful and be supportive in in to our siblings, you know, and and uh, the people in our conference and do the do the best things that we can. And so I appreciate your your work in sharing uh, in these services and putting together these resources for for your area, uh, not only to use this Sunday but continually. Um, I think that's super helpful um, when when we just share in those things. Yeah. There, there was a, a neat article that came out this week in the United Methodist News Service about the different ways that our Indian churches are uh, helping with the COVID-19 virus. And so the article featured uh, <clears throat> the support that uh, I believe it may have been uh, uh, Desert Southwest uh, who provided some uh, supplies uh, for the workers at the Indian hospital at Shiprock. And then that talked about uh, some work that, uh, that uh, our friend is doing in Portland, Oregon, Alan Buck. Alan who also comes out of uh, Hawaii, Oklahoma. And then some of the work that OMC has done with uh, helping some of our communities that struggle with the hardest. And so it's really fun to see uh, the great work that so many of our churches are doing. And, and for me, because uh, our churches have so little to begin with, but always find ways to reach out and we're very thankful for that. Now, and also now we're working with United Methodist Committee on Relief, who's providing us another grant to assist some other communities in, in OMC. And so we're thankful to MCOR, who's also going to be doing some work uh, with uh, funding the, the uh, great need in Navajo country for water and food and simple things that folks take for granted and some other pieces. So uh, that's a, that, I think that's a big, you know, those are stories that people don't know about, about what we do uh, for others, for each other around, around, the, around the country. 
Absolutely. And, and something that uh, I understand you all do very, very, very well is, is building the relationships and uh, sharing in culture and just um, bringing United Methodists around to see what you do and then sending them back out to share that in their communities with, uh, with an emergent project. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? And, uh, several years ago, when the uh, United Methodist Women did a study on missionary conferences, uh, the three I mentioned earlier, uh, people began calling and some would even uh, come to Oklahoma to, to, to spend a day to learn more about who we are. And these are folks who did this out of their own money and they would be teaching. And, and if you've ever taught at a mission you, uh, those uh, folks come prepared to learn. They're hardcore learners and ask great questions. And the good thing is when they're done, they go back home and tell the story and they do the work. And so, you know, when we had so many, we came up with an idea of doing an immersion around Oklahoma, around OMC, uh, looking at various issues and historic, historic events that have shaped our lives. And so the first year, I think we had maybe 10, and the next year it grew. This year we had about 35. And this year, we, we, it happened right before the COVID-19 virus really hit. And so we were able to go on with it. But we had folks from, uh, from uh, Massachusetts. We had folks from California, from uh, Texas, from Colorado, and from all over the country who come on their own, uh, who, who just want to learn about Native American people. And so we take them to three, two or three sites in Oklahoma. Um, one, of our, one of my uh, sites I always get to for personal and for briefs is at uh, Cheyenne, Oklahoma, where Pastor came to massacre mostly women and children among the Cheyenne tribe, where Black Kettle was killed. And so it's a, it's a national park now. And so we take them out there, we check out the beautiful museum, and then we take the, the trail where events actually happen. Folks are always amazed. Even Oklahoma folks always say, why don't we know that why don't we know this history? And it just we, it just was never shared. And then we go out to Ponca City to visit the Standing Bear Park, which is dedicated to Standing Bear uh, Ponca leader whose people were removed to uh, what is now Oklahoma uh, uh, early on and uh, uh, as they arrived, his son was sick, and his son made him promise, made his dad promise, if, if I pass away, you'll take me home to bury me among my people. And that happened, and so standing there in the dead of winter, and some others took the son back, and they were arrested, and, and then uh, later sent to trial. Uh, and it's interesting, because in the court system, the courts did not know that they had authority, because they did not understand Native people to be human beings. And so there are two... Uh, folk in the Northeast, I think, uh, attorneys and who found out and they came to represent Standing Bear. And it's a wonderful uh, or, uh, piece that he has uh, uh, about uh, his understanding. There's a quote he makes. He says, you pierce my hand, my hand is red. And if I pierce your hand, your hand is red. So he talks about this interrelatedness and that it is God who created us all. And then we spend the other time just learning about other issues and meeting people and visiting some of our ministry sites. And the fun the best part about this for us is that people have this personal experience. They go home and they tell the real story uh, to other people. So they advocate. Uh, some will send back mission teams. Uh, some send back financial contributions. But the neatest part is they tell other people. And other people from those areas come back. And some of these people have been here uh, three times, been all of them. And uh, that's been pretty neat because it shows the commitment and the willingness to go and share with other people about uh, our presence and the great things that are happening in OMC. Yeah. If you remember, uh, Zach, when we had uh, Jacob Armstrong on um, a while back, uh, he talked about uh, his church's connection yes. uh, from Tennessee to the <clears throat> church, to the OMC church in Clinton. Yes. Um, and, um, you know, there is those churches, like, you know, I'm in Tahlequah and our OMC church here, the D.D. Etcheson church, they have groups that come in all the time uh, that are willing to help and serve in, in unique and different ways. And to have that connection is is great. Like that's one of the things I love about um, the Methodist church is that connectedness of knowing that, Hey, you know, we can go somewhere and we'll find somewhere to connect into because we know there's a Methodist presence. Yeah. Our youth director and I were talking about that today. Um, we're talking about, you know, having to adjust our, uh, what our summer mission trip may look like because we may not be able to go where we were initially planning. Yeah. And I looked at, it and I said, you know, we can go anywhere and find a Methodist church that will be willing to help us find something. Um, yeah. I said, and that's not, 
I mean, I'm okay with making that phone call if we have to. Um, if we decide that we feel that it would be safe to take a trip, I'm not saying we're, you know, like I want, but, but like, you know, I, I, and I know that, you know, um, if we can look in certain areas where maybe there would be a church to connect into, you know, I, you would be the first person I would call to say, Hey David, is there a church here? Who do I need to call to, to see if we can do something? And I think that that's a great thing that our connection offers. It is. I'm, I'm, I'm most impressed that you have the likes of Jacob Armstrong on your program. <laughs> I got to meet Jacob after, um, I think 2012 General Conference in Tampa when United Methodist Church did this act of repentance and, and Jacob uh, tells a story that I, he was sitting there listening uh, and, and participating in the program and he said, I, we have to do more. And so he uh, called my office and actually has one of his pastors at the time called the office and said, we want to do some intentional ministry. We don't just want to come one time and leave. We want to create this partnership. I said, I've got, here's the place for you. So I sent them to Clinton, Oklahoma where we do ministry with uh, mostly shiny and Arapaho children. And they have been doing that since 2013. So they come every summer, they do a sports camp, they do this. They used to come at Christmas, they have built a playground uh, that's still standing in very good use uh, there at Clinton. And so uh, Jacob, uh, they really built this very intentional, long lasting relationship with so many. And uh, we appreciate Jacob and I always love to tell uh, that story and hear Jacob tell that story about those relationships and and this summer of course we've had several churches that have had to cancel uh vm teams so there'll be other opportunities for anyone looking for uh vim opportunities on any level uh we always uh, uh have plenty for folks to do and so uh, folks are interested hope they'll contact us that's one of my favorite things about our connection yeah. is is it very quickly teaches us that we're not any missions that we do, they're not one and done, that we're going and building these intentional relationships uh, with people, not so that we can, you know, save them or do this for them, but to be there, to be there with them in life and in their reality, and to get to know who they are, what they do and how they do it, and to continually come back to that. I, I think that's something beautiful that our United Methodist Connection offers. Um, and it just simply the opportunity to, to do it because we're connected in these ways and we don't have to look very far uh, to build these relationships. And I, I think that says something not only about the church uh, in general, but about the Methodist church and knowing, hey, we can go and, and do this long term. Uh, that it's not a one and done thing, uh, that we're actually going to do this with people uh, rather than for people and to build these long, long, lifelong relationships. And there's something very, very valuable in that. It's, it's been fun. I mean, I've been in this position for uh, uh, several years and, and of course my 30th year of ministry. And it's been interesting that you mentioned that, uh, Zach, to think back of uh, when I first began and volunteer teams that would come along. And, and many, there are many who came in and they, they just want to get it done. They come in, we want to build this building in the week. And there, there were churches who, who could come in and build a facility in the week and then they were gone. And so they didn't have much time for interaction. And so now the last uh, seven or eight years, you have volunteer teams who want to come and tend to create relationships. So, so the main piece is they say, we want to interact with the people when we come to the project. We want to work side by side, get to know them. And so it's been interesting to see how missions has changed since I first began. And ministry changed for the better, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. People really wanting to create some intentional relationships and and of course uh, both of you know across the church we we have uh, friends and colleagues all over the world that we get to see from place to place that's how we find that's how we find our resources we know we know people and uh people we've met from, from time to time and uh that's been wonderful when i was at Tahlequah, Matt, um one of my favorite things this was when before the new church was built had an old parsonage it was a uh, uh it, 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 you just took what you got and so we sit in the back, the backyard with the volunteer teams and the elders at the time. Most are gone now. They would sing beautiful Cherokee hymns. They were uh, bilingual. They could speak Cherokee. And so they would tell stories of their ancestors from uh, boarding school era and then about uh, Trail of Tears. And of course, sing their Cherokee hymns. Cherokees have some of the most beautiful hymns. And uh, that was always moving uh, for people to hear those stories, especially when they told what was behind those stories. And it wasn't always... Uh, you know, it uh, wasn't always good history, but yeah, it, 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 it talked about the perseverance and faithfulness of the people and the willingness to share that story with other people. 
who again took it home and were moved to understand the faithfulness of our people in such adversity during the trail and border school era and other other times of our lives. And that's when I always find it's funny is when um, I have friends and colleagues that call me and say, hey, um, do you have a connection to the Native American church that you can connect us to? And I'm like, well, I can, I can give you the person to really call that would know way more than I do. Um, and so I'm always glad to, you know, connect people to you or, you know, hey, yeah. you know, I'm now in a town that actually has a church and say, hey, would you be willing to come to Tahlequah? I'll, I'll host you. You can yeah. go work there. I mean, we, you know, we can set you up. Um, and so like, that's the one thing I love. And we've, we've talked about that at Great Link today. And I think that that's the whole deal with even with Native American Student Sunday is that, you know, we're, we want to connect to those and build those relationships. And so if you're a church listening to this, I know it's Friday and I hope that you have your videos done if you're pre-recording your services, that way you're not. But it, but if you need something, you know, I encourage you to, to look at the OIMC website. They have plenty of great resources there for you. Um, one of the things that I've been doing since this uh, season of, of COVID is, uh, I've been hopping in and listening to different churches, and one of the, the blessings that was mine uh, to experience was when the OIMC started doing what they've been doing and getting to hear those hymns yeah. uh, for for my soul uh, as a member of the Cherokee Nation to hear some of those hymns and and even you know that aren't necessarily my family's uh, connections. Just hearing it was just it just it just oh it speaks to my soul and uh it's been nice to do that and i you know encourage you to look at their website and uh connect in with them and uh, build relationships with uh the native community because it's it's it we can do better and we could we could uh heal some of the wounds if we're willing to build relationships and not just assume um and so david uh, i thank you for your time is there anything else you'd like to share with us as as we kind of bring this to a close you know you know we uh you know i I think often about uh, especially on Native American Ministry Sunday, and it's easy for me because you know I grew up in the state in my home home areas, not too far from Tahlequah. I uh, you know, spent every day at the hospital. My very first appointment was at the Wesley Foundation at Northeastern State University, which has the largest number of Native students of any in the country. And I, I shared with you before; those are very formative years in helping me to understand more about other tribes and uh, our uniqueness and the blessings we have to offer to others. And, and so as I travel around the state and other places, you know, I can point out places everywhere where our people have made a contribution uh, for our presence, what we've done. And it's a great feeling you know, for, for me to know that and always wanting to share that with other people. And that's why the immersion uh, conversations like these are so important because we, you know, we're very, very proud of what, who we are as indigenous peoples, uh, proud to be a part of the United Methodist Church even with this imperfection, even with this past and, and sometimes current reality of how we're treated, uh, we still remain faithful. And we, we know this is an avenue for which we serve and where God has called us to be and for us to make a difference in the lives of our people. And that's a joy uh, for us to be able to serve and for, for Zach and Matt to be able to share this story with others. So thank you for that. Appreciate it. Well, you know, like I had told you um, beforehand, um, I, you know, I, you'd been on my short list for a long time. I just never had thought about asking. And then I was like, well, um, maybe it's time, you know, with, I saw that this student was Sunday was coming up. I was like, maybe it'd be a good time to have him on the show and see if he'd be available to talk to us. Um, Cause I, I knew that you could tell the story way better than I could. And I would much rather come uh, from someone who's on the ground and have boots on the ground than, you know, standing, you know, off from the distance and has, limited Thank knowledge. You. You um, and so, you know, I'm glad you're able to join us. And um, we had to actually re-record this. Um, we had some technical <laughs> problems last time. This is the second time. So uh, the second time actually turned out really well. Um, so David, you know, we thank you. Uh, we want to encourage our listeners to go to our website at beardedtheologians.com. We'll share with you um, on it links to their website and their Facebook. And so that way you can connect into them and uh, get to uh, um, immerse yourself in them a little bit virtually um, would encourage you that when they offer um, when they're able to offer an immersion program mm-hmm. and when I saw that happening and and, and the OMC kept putting me out there I kept trying to share as much as possible because uh, I knew it would be a great experience for people and I'm hoping eventually to be able to do that myself um, yeah. and uh, you know I just want to encourage you to connect in with them and we'll have all that up on our website and so um, David thank you for joining us You're welcome. Well, thanks for having me so for the beard, for the bearded theologians, I'm Matt Franks. I'm Zach Bechtel. Thanks for checking us out. Thank you for listening to the Bearded Theologians podcast. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share on all social media outlets. 
can check out old episodes and more information at beardedtheologians.com. Thanks for checking us out.